uh, now show understanding of how factors contribute uh, to the performance of the computer. How factors contribute to the performance of the computer. Now, what is the performance of the computer? Performance of the computer, as I said uh, in, in the previous class, is not just that computer works fast. It's about overall throughput of the computer. All right. It really does not mean that if the computer can go fast, there might be lesser RAM uh, or slower delivery of the data that might hinder the speed of computer. So performance of the computer. First, let's talk about uh, the factors. Uh, clock speed, we discussed uh, yesterday and we, I want to discuss it again. So it is worth mentioning here the role of system clock first. The clock defines the clock speed. Uh, the, the clock defines the clock cycle, which synchronizes all computer operations. As mentioned uh, in yesterday's lecture, the control bus transmits signals, ensuring everything is fully synchronized. I, I told you that what is synchronization when few of the registers are working in a line and everyone knows that when the data will be delivered, all right, and how to work around it special purpose and when to deliver it further afterwards. So that working and taking of data and giving of data is actually done after the system clock. So if the system clock is slower, the clock speed becomes slower. When the clock speed becomes slower, the synchronization process becomes slower and the overall throughput goes down. So uh, the control bus transmits sig timing signals means that uh, the clock signal arrives through control bus. Uh, which ensures uh, the synchronization. By increasing the clock speed, the processor, the processing speed of the computer is also increased. All right. Uh, a typical um, value nowadays is 3.5 gigahertz, which means that 3.5 billion clock cycles per second. Although the speed of the computer may have been increased, it is not possible to say that computer's overall performance is necessarily increased by using higher clock speed. Other factors are, other than the clock speed, are bus width, processor type, and number of cores, and uh, cache memory or cache memory, whatever you call it. Other four factors used to be considered is um, uh, also the bus width. Okay, so um, bus width is a width uh, of the address bus and data bus that can affect the performance. Now, what is bus width? Actually, this is also called word size. Um, when we talk about computer, you might have heard that uh, someone says that I have got 32 bits computer, I've got 64 bits computer. Nowadays, commonly, uh, the computer is uh, actually 64 bits. What does it mean? It means that the width of the address bus and the data bus is actually 64 wires. And the size of the registers inside the microprocessor is 64. Uh, as far as the size of the register is concerned, that might be different, but uh, hypothetically, ideally, we think that way. Bus, but the size of the bus width um, for address bus and data bus is fixed. So what does it mean? It means that if, if the bus width for the address bus is 4, it means the highest address it can access would be 2 to power 4. All right? 2 to power 4 means 16 addresses, 0 to 15. If the bus width of uh, address bus is five, it means that it can deliver how many bits at a time? Five bits means 32 bits. Means, uh, sorry, 32 is the highest range. Means from zero to 31. So that is the highest address that you can access. Now let's say if the bus width, width is 32, means the address bus has got 32 wires in it. Address bus is a physical thing which is connecting the processor with the memory and other parts of the computer through the motherboard flies over the motherboard when the, when the processor is connected over the motherboard then these buses are running along over the motherboard so what i'm trying to say is uh bigger the um, address bus width higher the address that you can access now let's say your computer is 32 bits so if your computer's bus width is 32 bits, if your computer's word size is 32 bits, in that case, 2 to power 32. 2 to power 32 means 4 gigabytes, 4 GB. 
it means that if your computer is 32 bits and you have got memory installs 8 bit 8 gb or 16 gb that means that you won't be able to go beyond 4 gb all right but as we know that if you increase one bit the capacity goes double for example in one bit you may have two values but in two bits you may have four values in three bits you may have eight values in four bits you may have 16 values similarly if it is 32 bits you may have 4 gb in 33 bits you may have 8 gb in 30 4 bits you may have 16 GB in 5 bits you may have 32, uh, 35 uh, bits you may have 32 GB and similarly with every increasing bit the capacity of the RAM that you can access as microprocessor gets doubled. So higher the bus width, more the data that you can access, more uh, uh, the addresses that you can access in computer's memory. This is actually very important concept and we will discuss this concept when we will be um, studying indirect addressing again okay. so bus width means the number of wires every single wire represents a single bit in address bus and the data bus higher the bus width more the data that you can bring into the microprocessor all right if the register is of the same uh, amount of bits then that data can be consumed in one go all right so width bus width or the word size is actually a very important factor for the performance of computer. And then we have got uh, clock speed. Yesterday I discussed about overclocking. So clock speed is the speed of the microprocessor and what they do, they set the BIOS for the clock speed, which is not maximum for that particular uh, microprocessor in your computer. So your computers are mostly a little under power. That is done to avoid any excessive heat generated through the microprocessor. So to have more life to your computer. But some gamers, they want to increase the speed of the uh, processor or few of the programmers, they wanted to for better processing. So what they do, they do overclocking. So overclocking is actually the clock speed can be changed by accessing the basic input output system, which is BIOS. Yeah, and when you start your computer, you can hit F2. In some of the computers, if it is F10, whatever, different brands have different, I've got Dell computers, so F2 basically takes you to the BIOS. In BIOS, there is a setting that can be used to overclock your computer. However, using uh, clock speed higher than the computer was uh, designed for, um, um, for, for your better processing purposes but that can lead to problems such as execution of instruction outside the design limit. So basically the idea is that uh, everything should be done within the limit which is set by the company. And this uh, execution of instructions outside design limits which can lead to serious unsynchronized operations might be clock running faster and the instruction cycle itself is slower. In other words, an instruction is unable to complete it before the next due clock cycle for the execution and the computer would frequently crash and become unstable. So mind it that when you, whenever you overclock, this might give rise to the troubles. You see, uh, every instruction requires some time to complete. What if the clock cycle is going um, faster than that completion of the execution time for the single instruction? In that case, computer will not be able to cope up with the clock speed and the synchronization will be disturbed. When the synchronization is disturbed, computer will start crashing. Thirdly, the cache memory or the cache memory. Cache memory or cache memory, what does it mean? This is the memory inside the microprocessor. If you go into the BIOS or you go and see the specification of your computer, you might come across a type of memory which is L1 level 1, L2 level 2 and L3 level 3 memories. These are actually the memories inside the microprocessor. You see, basically what happens, there is a problem in one human architecture and that problem is the delivery of the data and instruction from the RAM to the microprocessor. Think of it this way. Let's say um, there are 100 nanoseconds for one instruction. Basically what happens that the delivery, the travel of the instruction from the RAM to the processor takes 99 nanoseconds. Nano is one billionth of a second. So when computer tries to load, in fact, it could execute cycle instruction, instruction arrives in MDR in 99 nanoseconds. 
And when processor, because it is a speedy machine, it's a faster machine, when it executes it, it takes only one nanosecond. So practically, if you look into it, out of 100% time, 99% of the time, processor is waiting for the instruction to arrive. As soon as instruction arrives from the RAM to the processor, it is executed. And that execution time is only one nanosecond. If it is one nanosecond, it means that processor is practically 99% of the time sitting idle, waiting for the data and instruction to arrive so that it can act upon it. So that is actually a very important factor that you need to understand. It is called von Neumann bottleneck. So what is the bottleneck that computer requires instruction to act on? That instruction when it arrives, it arrives slow. It arrives slow, although it is fast in human terms, but in computer's terms, it is slow. So practically computer is just free. Remember, this is just analogy to make you understand. Practically computer is just free for 99% of the times. So what happens no matter how fast the computer is, since it has to wait for a long time, a very, 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 very long time relative to the execution time, it has to wait. And that wait will keep the computer slower. All right. If you are given a work, only then you can do it. If someone says that, wait, we are leaving the work and you are waiting, you are waiting, you are doing nothing. You are idle. When you are idle, you are doing nothing. No matter how fast, how good you are, you are still waiting. So for that reason, what happens, they have developed cache memory or cache memory, the memory inside the microprocessor. So what basically happens when the program at first starts, it brings not just one instruction, since the processor is actually a sequential machine, operating system knows that after this instruction, the next instruction will be executed, then next, then next, then next, and in the series, what it does, instead of bringing in just one instruction, operating system now knows that processor has got its own memory called cache memory inside itself. It brings the bunch of instruction from the instruction which requires to be executed and onwards, a bunch of instruction arrives in the microprocessor. That bunch of instruction is now in microprocessor and the area where it is saved is called cache memory. Now from that cache memory, since the data has already, the instruction has already arrived, the data instruction has already arrived, now it, it, it is at the disposal of the microprocessor. Now microprocessor will start one instruction executed, take second instruction and execute it, and by the time that cache is, the, the instructions in the cache are all executed, another bunch arrives. So the delay that was there for every single instruction that was making the processor sit idle for 99% of the times is actually now finished and it is there just for the first time when the first bunch of instruction arrives. So when the program starts, this actually happens and afterwards because of the presence of this cache, it doesn't happen. So processor then works at it, its full capability. Before that, it was just waiting for every other instruction to be uh, at its disposal. So the use of cache memory can also improve processor performance. It is similar to RAM in that its content are lost when the power is turned off. Cache uses static RAM, SRAM, we will discuss about it, SRAM later. Whereas most computers uses DRAM for the main memory. So the main memory RAM is DRAM, which is dynamic RAM made up of capacitors and inside the computer, the microprocessor, uh, the RAM is SRAM, which is static RAM. It is made up of certain types of uh, uh, gates, which are called uh, uh, universal gates. If you do remember from your logic gates, these are either uh, not end or not OR gates. And the name of the circuit is called uh, SR flip-flop or JK flip-flop. And these flip-flops are made up of NAND and NOR gate, and they are used to keep the data. So, Therefore, cache memory will have faster time access since there is no need to keep refreshing, which slows uh, down the access time. When a processor reads memory, it first checks out cache and then moves on to main memory if the required data is not in the cache. The cache memory stores frequently use instructions and data that need to be accessed faster. This improves the performance. All right, this improves the performance. Now, the DRAM, DRAM has capacitor and we knew, know that this device capacitor will lose its energy with the passage of time. If it loses its energy with the passage of time, computer needs to, rec to refresh it. That refreshing in the main memory also uh, hinders the performance of the microprocessor because that refreshing takes time. That is because the main memory is made up of capacitors, not NAND or NOR gates, SR or JK circuits. So, 
that is one factor. The other factor is the amount of time that it takes to reach the microprocessor in order to overcome these two, a bunch of instruction arrives in cache. So whenever processor requires data and instruction, which are necessary for the processor to go on, as we know from, my, uh, from this fetch decode execute cycle, they are now in cache. Processor checks in cache, if it is there, it accesses directly. Or by the time that cache is lapsed, used, another bunch of data and frequently used data and instruction arrives in the cache. So that is actually one thing. The fourth factor is we discussed about bus rate, we discussed about clock speed, we discussed about cache memory. Now let's talk about processor and number of cores. The fourth factor is the use of different number of cores. The core is made up of an ALU, a CU, and registers. Arithmetic logic unit, control unit, and registers means cores are actually nowadays a full-fledged computer. And the jacket that you see, the processor, when you purchase a processor, it's something two by two inches, but there is not a single processor. This is actually a jacket. Inside that jacket, there are multiple processors. As I told you in my previous lecture that the processor is so small, it is, uh, it is sometimes one fourth of my fingertip. It might be smaller than that. So over that jacket, there are multiple processors. And these processors are actually wired together so that they can be controlled and they can share their work. So those ALU, CU and registers combinedly is one core and there are multiple cores in that jacket that you see nowadays for AMD Athlon for AMD, um, other processors, and then i5, and i7s, i3s, i9s, they all have got a different number of cores in it. The use of different number of cores, uh, one core is made up of ALU, CU, and registers, can improve, number of cores can improve uh, computer performance. Many computers are dual core, means dual core means the computer is, the CPU is made up of two cores, or quad cores. Quad core means that the CPU is made up of uh, four cores. The idea of using more cores alleviates the need of continually increasing the clock speed. Since there are, these cores can distribute their work and they can concurrently, simultaneously uh, perform the tasks. However, doubling the number of cores does not necessarily double the processor performance since we have to take into account the need for the CPU to communicate with each other. This will reduce overall performance. All right, now what basically happens, let's say I have got two cores and I need to add four numbers. If it would be a one core thing, I will take one number, then take second number, add it, two operations. Then I will take third number and add it, three operations. And then I will take one number and add it, four operations. Four operations, four instructions. Four instructions means more instruction cycles and more clock cycles. Let's say I've got dual core computer. Dual core means I have got two cores. Now I will take two numbers and give it to one computer, the one core one CPU core, other two number and I'll give it as operating system to another core. Now, uh, first core while it is taking first number, second core is taking third number. First core while it is adding second number to first number, second core is actually adding fourth number to third number. Means now the instruction that was being taken in four clock cycle or instruction cycle is now being executed in two clock cycle. But the thing is, because they both are working at the same time. But the thing is, you need to have a result of all four numbers. Then the number from the first core and number from the second core, the addition of the two numbers from the first core, the addition of the two numbers from the second core will be taken and given to first core. Now first core has got two numbers. So it will take first result of the first core and it will take second result of the second core and add them up. So how many instructions are they, uh, there which are executed as per the time? Two first because they were concurrently done and two later. So overall time, how much time has been taken? Same. It, if it would have done by one processor, it is one, two, three, four instruction. It, if it is done by two processors, earlier they took two instructions each at the same time. So we will just count two instructions. But when these two results are need to be combined, they will be again given to the first core and they will add it again, again two instructions. So the number of instructions remains the same. So increasing the number of core is actually not the guarantee that the overall performance will be increased. But if it happens for larger numbers, then definitely there will be an advantage. So let's say if it is 100 numbers that are required to be added and we have got four cores. So what will happen? 
First core is given 25 numbers, 1 to 25. Second core is given 25 numbers, 26 to 50. Third core is given 25 numbers, 51 to 75. And fourth core is again given 25 numbers, 76 to 100. They will add all these numbers concurrently, simultaneously in 25 instructions. So when 25 clock cycles are performed or instruction cycles are performed, all these 100 numbers are added by their respective cores. But now the cores have got four results, 1, 2, 3, 4. First core has got result for first 25 numbers. Second core has got result for second 25 numbers. Third core has got third 25 numbers result addition. And then fourth core has got last from 76 to 100 uh, numbers addition with it. So these are four results. So these four results will again be taken two and two given to two different uh, cores. And then these will be finished in four instructions. So overall 25 plus four, 29 instructions were taken to add up how many numbers? 100. Had that been a single processor, it would have taken 100 cycles. With four uh, processor, it had taken 29 cycles. Now, since the number of uh, uh, additions has improved, the, the difference in the performance, you can see. If it is four cores, it is 29 instructions that, that were used to add 100 numbers. Otherwise, it was for lesser number of instructions is the same. So when the work grows, the performance improves, but otherwise it does not. So the use of uh, a different number of cores can improve processors or computers' performance. Many computers are dual core, means two cores, few, of, uh, few are quad cores, which are means four cores. The idea of using more cores alleviates the need to continually increase the clock speed because clock speed basically gives rise to uh, heat as well. However, doubling the number of cores does not uh, necessarily double the computer performance since we have to take into account the need for computer CPU to communicate with each other. So if they won't communicate properly in time, it would be difficult. This will reduce overall performance. For example, dual core has one channel and needs the CPU to communicate with both cores, reducing some of the potential increase in its imp improvement. Channel means the connection between two cores. So if a control unit wants to communicate with another or the operating system wants to talk to other processor, but that why the channel is being used to used by the first processor operating system would have to wait to go to second because there is just one channel that is being used for both the processors so that might be a problem quad core has got six channels six channels how let's say these are quad core one two three four so they are connected one two three four with four wires and then they are connected diagonally as well five and six so one two three four so they are connected like this, 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 and then diagonally as well. So it is now six channels. So connecting with any processor for quad core becomes easier. But if it is just if it is just two computers, there is one channel connecting that. So if it is one channel and processor wants to communicate with second core, but the first core is actually holding up that channel, it means that operating system would have to wait. So that is how it works. All of these factors need to be taken into account when considering computer performance. So that is actually. Uh, for the computer's performance. Now, understand how different ports provide connection to peripheral devices, including USB, HDMI, VGA. So this VGA and HDMI is added to this particular new syllabus. Otherwise, uh, uh, only USB used to be there. All right. So what are computer ports? Let's first discuss them. What are computer Ports. You might have seen several ports on your computer and your uh, cell phone. Uh, like this cell phone has got uh, USB-C in it, USB-C in it, but there are conditions when you would have seen USB-A, the bigger one, or uh, uh, other ports like VGA and all. So we are quite used to with these. Over the desktop, you might have seen, um, uh, or your laptop, you might have seen VGA and HDMI as well. So input and output devices are connected to a computer via ports. Remember, ports are not just those which you see over the casing. Ports are sometimes inside uh, the uh, chassis or chassis, inside the chassis as well, that computer's box, system box. Um, all the devices inside the system, uh, like uh, the, the hard disk, it is connected over using a, a port as well, over the motherboard. So everything which is connected, which is not part of the processor, is connected to the processor 
using a port. When, when you connect it, basically you are giving it under the control of microprocessor. So all those devices which are outside the microprocessor, except RAM, because that is the part of microprocessor, all those devices, when they're connected to the port, actually they come under the control of microprocessor at the discretion of the microprocessor so that microprocessor could use it. When does it use it? It uses it when you ask for it. If you want to open a file from a hard disk or from SD card or from another computer over the internet or your local area network, the processor wants to access it. If processor wants to access it and it is available, it is only through ports. So input and output devices are connected to a computer via ports. The interaction of the ports with connected input and output is controlled by the control unit. All right, so mind it. So interaction of the ports is actually controlled by the control unit. You might have seen uh, the HDMI port, the, the USB-C port, your computer uses different types of ports, the VGA ports. So let's first discuss USB port. <coughs> universal serial bus port. The universal serial bus is, a, is a, uh, asynchronous serial data transmission. Asynchronous serial data transmission means what? Uh, it means a type of data which actually is not in sync. Rather, a signal first goes and tells that the data is, to, is, is actually going to be arrived and when data is arriving, there is no synchronization. The speed of the data is different. When the whole data is arrived, another signal comes that now the data has arrived. We will discuss about it. The USB is an asynchronous serial data transmission method. It has quickly become the standard method for transferring data between computers and number of devices. All right, the USB cable consists of four wired shielded cable with two wires for power and the earth and two wires used for the data transmission. So it is actually possible, like I have connected my phone over here with this USB-C. This is USB-C and this is my phone. So what is basically happening while I'm accessing data from this phone through my computer, I am also basically charging my phone because two of the wires, which are actually uh, earth and power can be used for charging. So I am charging. And if I want to access the data on the phone, I can, I can do that as well. So that is the beauty of USB cable. When the device is plugged in, like my cell phone, I just showed it to you into a computer using one of the USB ports, the computer automatically detects the device that is present. This is due to the small change in the voltage level on the data signal wire in the cable. All right, so the cable's data signal wire, the voltage over that wire gets changed. And from that change, computer sends that which device it is. The device is automatically recognized by the operating system then, and the appropriate device driver is loaded up so that computer and device can properly communicate. All right. So uh, if the new device is detected, which was not previously detected, in that case, uh, the computer will look for the device driver. Mostly the device drivers are present at the time of um, installation of the devices in the Windows operating system or the Mac operating system. If it is not, then system asks for it. All right, or system downloads it from the uh, website of the vendor. The USB uh, system has become the in industry standard, means every other device nowadays. When I was of your age, I still remember that at the back of, we did not have these laptops, we had just desktops. So at the back of the desktop, there were so many ports, so many ports. One port is for keyboard, the other one is for mouse, for the VGA, for LPT1, for the printer, and there are so many others. Okay, so every different type of uh, the device was using a different kind of port. Since the inclusion of this USB and the standardization of it, now almost all of the devices they are using USB ports. And one, one good thing about USB port is that it, it can be used like power extension. You know what power extension called and the system is, you plug it to the power and then you have got this extension and you put several plugs. So you are sharing the power. Similarly, one port can be used to share as many as 128 devices, but you need to mind it that uh, since these devices are also drawing their power from the port, so the port might be able to deliver the data, but power, since the power will be shared among the ports, device might not work. So not many, but uh, devices can be shared as many as 128. So there are actually advantages and disadvantages. Let's first uh, see what are the advantages. Uh, devices plugged into the computer are automatically detected and device drivers are automatically loaded up. The connectors can only fit one way. 
which prevents uh, incorrect connections being made means two of the sites are actually different if, if it is USB C then USB C on one device and USB on other device you cannot actually reverse it it would go the same way because the port shape is different but the standard is same USB this has uh, become the stand uh, industry standard which means the considerable support is available now to the users several different data transmission rates are supported all right it is up to five point something GB with USB C and uh, USB 3 3.01 newer USB standards are backward compatible always so if you are connecting a USB 2 port with USB C that is fine if you are connecting USB 2 with USB 3 that is fine as well so they tame down or speed up their self these were the advantages now disadvantages the present transmission rate is limited to uh, 500 megabits all right uh, the maximum cable length is presently about five meters if you go beyond five meters you might have trouble for usb the older usb standards such as uh, one one or 1.1 may not be supported in the near future so that is fine because i don't i have not seen any cable or port which is still using usb one standards all right so that was usb now let's talk about hdmi high definition multimedia interface this is one best thing that has occurred it is actually a real good thing now it is every computer every modern computer or laptop is equipped with it so it can carry uh, data and voice and video signals but i have not seen it uh, that people are using for that uh, for this thing for data transfer rather they are basically using it for multimedia transmission the high definition multimedia interface ports allow outputs both audio and visual from the computer to hdmi enabled devices like tvs and monitors and multimedia projectors they support high definition signals enhanced or standard high definition signals they might be controlled sometimes they are enhanced or they are sometimes standard for the devices hdmi was introduced as a as a digital replacement for the older vga uh, analog system vga you might have heard of it all older monitor those thick monitor with crts inside it was uh, VG enabled and it was analog so HDMI actually has digitized version modern uh, high definition televisions have the following features which are making VGA a redundant technology now what are those features they use widescreen formats 16 to 9 ratio all right that is not possible with VGA the screens use greater number of pixels typically 1920 and 1081 this is called uh, <coughs> full HD or 1080p all right, this is called Full HD or 1080p. And sometimes now, now get, nowadays we have got uh, uh, this 4K as well. So HDMI actually supports 4K. So the faster frame rate as well, sometimes, um, and refresh rate. So sometimes refresh rate goes, nowadays you might have heard that 90 hertz refresh rate is going to be common 120. And few of the phones have gone more than 120 hertz refresh rate and more than 120 frames per second. So this can only be actually supported by uh, HDMI and not VGA. The range of colors is extremely large. Some com companies claim up to 4 million different colors of variations and VGA can only show less than that. Maybe 256 colors or 65K colors. This means that the modern television require more data because they have capability of larger screen, more pixels, more frames per second, more refresh rate. They require more data and more data cannot be delivered using VGA. So it will be actually delivered using HDMI, which has to be received at a much faster rate. The, the more data is also needs to be, since you, you know that video and sound are actually time bound. They are time dependent. If you won't deliver them in the given time frame, that you would see a flickering video or a choppy voice in order to avoid it. What basically happens you have to deliver the data faster so you need more data at faster speed and that it can only be done using hdmi so hdmi increases the bandwidth means the amount of data in a, in a, in a unit of time making it possible to supply necessary data for high quality sound and visual effects hdmi can also afford some protection against the piracy since it uses high bandwidth digital copy protection so hdmi is also preferred by few of the vendors so high bandwidth digital copy protection or HDCP uses a type of authentication protocol and uh, that authentication protocol can be used 
and you might have heard of the Blu-ray. Few of the Blu-ray discs are actually copyright protected, and if they are actually um, pirated, they don't work. A Blu-ray player uh, will check the authentication key of the device that is sending the data, such as high definition, that it is sending the data to. If the key can be authenticated, then handshaking takes place, otherwise system will deny that this uh, DVD cannot be played back. So HDMI is used which, with the HDCP, high bandwidth data copy protection, and that is used by many uh, Blu-ray DVD producers in order to protect the piracy. Then comes the uh, video graphics area of VGA card. As we have discussed about it, that it is actually old and standard. It was not digital, it was actually analog and that was uh, um, not able to send more data over faster rates. And uh, the data required to be converted to analog form before it, is, it was being sent. So typical, the size, the typical size was just 640 by 480, 640 by 480 pixels. And nowadays we have got 3,280 multiplied by 2,600 something, that is all 4K. So we need to deliver a lot of data that is only possible using uh, HDMI, but not VG. VG was introduced at the end of 1980s. That was itself a blessing that time, VGA. VGA was introduced uh, at the end of 1980s. VGA supports 640 by 480 pixel resolution on a television or monitor screen. Uh, it can also handle a refresh rate up to 60 hertz. All right, and 60 or 60 frames per second. Provided there are only 16 different colors being used. Only 16 means the color number of bits for color, which is four. If the pixel density is reduced to 200 by 320, then it can support up to 256 colors. So means that you have got only a certain number of um, uh, content units that can be delivered in time. So if you if you want to deliver more colors, you would have to decrease the number of pixels. And if you want more pixels, then you would have to decrease the number of colors. In any of the cases, basically, a VG card uh, uh, and VGA port were not able to deliver more than that. The technology is analog. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, is phased out. Now, I, I don't see any more VGA monitors or televisions. They all are now either LCD or LED. So uh, let's summarize the pros and cons of uh, HDMI and VGA. So the pros of uh, HDMI are that the current standard for modern television and monitors are HDMI. They, these are the advantages. Allow for a very fast data transfer rate, improved security, support modern digital systems. But there are disadvantages of um, HDMI as well. Not very robust connection, easy to break. Sometimes it flickers. Limited cable length to retain good signal. Uh, larger the cable signal will become weak. So if the cable is made from uh, some unknown uh, vendor, in that case, uh, you might see um, an image or sound which is not at par even. There are currently uh, uh, these issues with the HDMI. And let's see what are the advantages of uh, VGA. Uh, those advantages or disadvantages are now all gone because the, the technology is almost phased out. Uh, VGA was a simpler technology, it is advantage. Uh, only one standard available, there were no changes. All right, and uh, in HDMI, there are five different standards are being used. Mm. Mind that, in, in this, this, could be an, uh, this could be a disadvantage that in HDMI, there are five different standards are being used. So it is possible that the cable that you have purchased would have a different standard used for making it and the device that you have will be expecting a different standard. So these two different standards might be actually when you connect a different standard based cable to a different standard based port, the data will be delivered but the output would be poor. Output would be poor. In VGA, there was just one standard. So if there is a device and there is a cable, they all are made just out of one standard. Uh, in VGA, it is easy to split the signal and connect a number of devices from one source. So I have seen these uh, splitters where you have got just one monitor, sorry, one um, desktop machine and there is splitter. All right. That is splitting machine uh, can actually send the data to different monitors or it can split the output um, to different monitors. So that was also possible. Uh, and the connection was, the VGA connection was actually very secure. Uh, the disadvantages are uh, 
that first of all, VGA itself is outdated now. It is easy to bend the pins when making connection. Oh God, that was something very, very, very common. So if you are, if you are a bit, uh, uh, means you, when you are pushing your cord or connector to the port and you are basically not at the exact location. So one of the pin does not go to its own hole. The pin will be then stumbled. All right. And then I'm using my pen and pencil to straight it up so that I could actually push it against the port and all. So that was one very common thing. And we had to actually uh, change uh, the cable most of the time. It's still at few schools and at few uh, tuition centers, I do see that the uh, multimedia monitors are still having these VGA ports. And since the HDMI cable is costlier, it is expensive than VGA core, many of the institutions are still supporting uh, VGA. So HDMI port is expensive, HDMI cable is expensive and VGA port cables are uh, basically are very cheap. So if in VGA, the last thing, if it is a VGA and you want a good uh, output or at least the output to the fullest, you, you had to actually pay for expensive cables because uh, these ordinary cables were not able to deliver the proper data. And it is not the case for HDMI, even if it is from a cheaper source or uh, it is not that good, but it's still uh, the least amount of data which is being delivered is so, so high that you actually uh, won't feel much of the difference, but that was not the case with VGA. So this was just the theory, theory, theory part today that we have discussed. We first discussed that uh, factors that contribute to the performance of the computer. And then we discussed that what are the ports that computer uses to deliver the data and all. Now from the next uh, lecture, <clears throat> we will start the practical part of it. We would have so many things to discuss and then we would have the whole assembly language to understand and read the programs from. And there is another part which was earlier in A2's bit manipulation and we would have an extended version of our assembly language commands for bit manipulation as well. So that's about it.